Okay, well, let's begin in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for the time that we can have this evening to read your word together. Well, we pray that you give to us understanding. Help us to learn how we are to live for you. And we pray that you would give to us that wisdom that we need. We pray that you would bless this time. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Okay, now this is all connected, okay, from verse 11 all the way down. <clears throat> right? And so we're going to look at verse 13, but we begin with verse 11, so we see the connection. Okay? So Paul says to Timothy, You, O man of God, but you, O man of God. How do we understand this whole idea of being a man of God? Okay. Now, it is not just, okay, now, therefore, the women folks, yeah, no need to learn anything here. Because he's just talking to the men folks. It's not. Okay, this is a phrase used. Right? By those who serve the Lord. Okay, see? We've got to understand our relationship with God. First, we understand we are man human being with all his weaknesses. Now the one part we've got to understand, right? There must be obviously be humility before God. Who are we? We are but man, mortal. Obviously. Right? Now, of God would tell you one who have been born of God one who now belongs to God, reconciled with God. Right. Now, obviously, you, we must know how to live for God. Isn't it? So there are obviously certain things that we need to know. Man of God. Now, right? Flee these things. Okay, what are these things? Uh, love for money, uh, greediness, desire to be rich, these things, flee. Unfortunately, many, but a lot of people, these are the things they chase, not flee. And they will do anything to get rich quick. This is how this Bitcoin thing come about. What is the draw? You can get rich very fast. <clears throat> right? This is why you have casinos. No need to... Um, they don't shut. 24 hour running. No night, no day. Somebody is hoping to hit a jackpot somewhere, win something, get rich. The desire is so powerful. Isn't it? And it just it really humiliates man to, to me. I remember in many years we were uh, holidaying in Singapore. See, I, Singapore is a place of work for me. It's also a holiday. Whatever, short break. Well, so we were in this uh, resort world in uh, Sentosa Island. And uh, so I didn't want to disturb the kids. Uh, the, the, those who are still sleeping. So you rise up a bit earlier. Huh? You want to uh, do your own work. So I went downstairs early in the morning to go to a cafe somewhere. It is nearby. Then you pass by, the, in the front is the casino in Singapore, the resort world. And it was such a... You know what happened? People were sleeping on just on the bench outside... You know, people cleaning, sweeping, you see young and old, people are just sleeping outside. Right? Because they cannot sleep inside. You are, you doze off, you get kicked out. And so they sleep 
catch whatever nap, go back in, gamble some more. That was just such a sorry sight. What is, what is that? See, the desire makes a person do. You can do good things, or you can do things. It's just such a powerful draw. Right? Uh, those who desire fall into temptation and a snare. To be gambling is such a temptation and such a snare. It really is, in more ways than one. Right? This is Bitcoin thing is nothing short of gambling. Same. People lose. The only people who gets it is they have like cash to burn. Okay, okay, you're gonna hit hit something somewhere. And and that's scary. Now, right? Look, flee these things. <coughs> what are we pursuing in life? So there are things we should obviously flee. Okay, F-L-E-E, -E, not F-L-E-A. Right? And there are things we ought to really pursue. Right? What are we pursuing <coughs> in life? Seriously. Right? We often think, okay, what am I pursuing? I'm pursuing an education, that I'm pursuing a, after that, work, a career, that I'm pursuing a life partner, then I pursue marriage, then I pursue family, then I pursue... We often think of our pursuits as these things. It could be even ministry, Right? But what should we really pursue in life? What should the man of God pursue? Now we need to know. What is God looking for? Right? What is God seeking us to pursue? Okay, now here's an important text in Micah 6. We should know this text. Right? This is an important, actually, a, a, a good text to really note. Take a look at the book of Micah, not Minor Prophets. Right? So we've been reading um, devotional on uh, some of the Minor Prophets. Now, this is a text that really is vital. In Micah chapter, chapter 6, <clears throat> Has God through the ages shown us what we ought to pursue? The answer is, of course. It's a question of whether man is interested. Wisely heed it or not. Okay, so Micah 6 okay, begins with, Hear now what the Lord says. Right? And then this is what God is saying to His people in verse 3, O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? You seem to be very tired. Right? And a lot of people, they are just so tired out in their faith, in their walk with God, in their service, and they're just so tired to seek God. <coughs> and so God says, how have I wearied you? Have I given you too much? Right? Now, watch. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent you uh, Moses, Aaron, Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now. Right? So this is recalling history, what God has done. What Balak the king of Moab counseled, Balaam the son of Ber answered him. Right, this is in the book of Numbers. They wanted to curse, this king wanted to curse Israel. And every time curse, God reversed it. Bless. And it says, Whom God bless, no one can curse. Oh, that, is a wonderful, uh, this is, that is a wonderful story. When the Lord marks a person with blessing, you cannot curse. 
no matter what. This is we don't need to fear. Right? Now, there is because of the Lord that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. That's the point. Okay? So when the Lord blesses us, what, do we, what are we learning? What do we know about God? We mustn't forget. Now, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, uh, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What is God looking for in worship? You see, some people think, oh, Cain and Abel, you know why God rejected uh, Cain's offering? Because he gave fruit. God likes meat. That is a silly interpretation. It's got nothing to do with this is a fruit and this is a burnt offering. It's got to do with the heart. What is God looking for? Your, you can bring the right sacrifices. Now, we read, this is uh, what God has shown you, O man. Verse 8, He has shown you, O man. See, man of God, man. Man, right? What is good? And what does the Lord require of you? One, to do justly. Two, to love mercy. Three, to walk humbly with your God. This is man. <clears throat> three things. Can you do three things? To do justly. To love mercy. To walk humbly before your God, with your God if you want to sum up everything. This is what God is looking for when we serve Him, living for Him, right? We ask, what does it mean to live for God? What are we pursuing? See, what shall we flee? Yes, those things, obviously. Because it is not doing justly, right? It is certainly not walking with God. What shall we pursue in life? Right? Now, let's, this is Micah 6 and verse 8. It should be a verse memorized that we may know because God has shown you, O oh man, how you should live, how, what will please Him, what He's looking for. Right? <clears throat> now, 1 Timothy 6, we go back. O oh, man of God, flee these things. Now, pursue. 1. Righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. What is all this? See, this is what faith is. Faith has expressions. It is, faith is never mere, I believe in God. Anyone can say, I believe in God. Faith would change our lives. True faith would be expressed in a development of your character. Pursue these things. All this has to do with your character. Who you are. Right? So Micah 6 is summed, is the essence. Here is, you want to, what does it mean to do justly and love mercy? Now, it means you can add on. This is a bit expanded version to look into further details. This is so important. In other words, to be that person. <clears throat> it is that person. Right? Rather than just programs, that person can make all the difference. This is what I was trying to say to one, uh, you know, this person who used to 
uh, help, we used to help out a Salvation Army officer. He was the pastor of the church in Armadale. And every year we would help him out. Now he's not contacted. He must have just, they must have moved him on. And I know him ever since he, I, I came back here for almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. When he first started out, contacted, okay. And he was starting out in ministry. I was starting out in ministry. Every year I ask him, oh, he's just so worn out. He said, I'm just so worn out. I'm trying this program. I'm trying that program. I'm trying to reach it. I'm trying to build this church up. I'm trying to help build up the congregation for years and years and years. Literally, five years, six years, seven years. Just things don't work out. His congregation is going smaller and smaller and smaller. People leaving. He just, and he is just, since once he was just so depressed. He said he really had a tough year. He had to take four months off because he was depressed. So I tried to encourage him. I said to him, it is not programs alone if you want to succeed. It is you, person. You've got to grow your knowledge of God. So I tried to give him books, the devotionals, try to encourage him to be equipped in the Lord's words. I asked him, what do you speak on? He tells me what he speaks on. I said, wow. You've got to develop your character. You've got to develop your life. You've got to develop knowledge of the person. All this has to do with the person. Pursue. You pour all your energies here. Well, I've got a music program. I'm going to bring the kids in. I'm going to do music for them. I want to do this for them. I want to do... He burnt out. He literally burnt out. That's what happens. A lot of the times, I've just tried to tell him, you, you, you're not going to be able to sustain this. Yeah, okay, I'll try, I'll try. Every year is the same. It was, it's just tough. Started with serving husband and wife. Then the wife just quit. <laughs> Can't take it. So he's serving alone. Small little congregation. His congregation is about 30 people. Big premises. I've seen the premises. 30 people. How are you going to sustain any program? You're going to try and do this. You're going to go here, go there. He's all over the place. Literally all over the place. He's a big fellow. He's just so tired out. That's why Paul says to Timothy, pursue this. Because it is not... He, why didn't Paul tell him? Okay, now, Timothy... You gotta have this YPG program. You gotta have this prayer meeting. You gotta have this Bible study. You gotta have this one, this thing here, this that. Those things are fine. But without this, this will fail. Pursue this, O oh man of God. You see, this is what we should be pursuing. Right? Develop this. With knowledge, as we gain knowledge, what, are, what comes out? Right? With every passing year, what are we honing? Are we truly pursuing, cultivating righteousness? There is more righteousness. Cultivating godliness. Faith, love, patience, gentleness. <coughs> Pursue. The problem is we know it's there. Okay, yeah, these are the things. All right, but I'm doing it all over the place. You see the word pursue? If only we take heed. This is so important, right? So, obvious focus, person. Be that person. It makes all the difference. 
in any ministry. Okay? This is what we are, we are praying, we are hoping, we are... That you be that person. That God can use and be a blessing. But you've got to be there. Right? Now, this is absolutely vital. Now, we go on, of course. Right? Fight the good fight of faith. <coughs> Obviously. You've got to be able to understand there is a spiritual battle that we are to engage in. Lay hold on eternal life. This is important. Right? Eternal life. What is this life? What is the life that Jesus meant for His disciple when He talked about fruitfulness? When He talked about abundant life? Right? Now, the, all these things must be understood. To which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay? Now, we, tonight we're going to look at verse 13 a little bit uh, closer. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Now, what does this mean? <coughs> okay? Right? I urge you in the sight of God. Now, the word urge you is... Um, when, what comes to mind when you say, okay, I urge you? Okay, I encourage you. I prompt you. I nudge you. I... <laughs> What? I urge you. Yeah, I try to persuade you, right? So it's not exactly a great... Uh, trend. In, in this sense, I'm not sure why the English word comes out as I urge you. Because you look at verse 17, where Paul says, command those, right? The word urge, the word command, it's the same word in the Greek text. For whatever reason, they choose the word urge. Maybe this, it comes out too bad. Now, this is, what does it mean? What Paul is saying, I command you. I charge you. That's a very strong word. It is not merely, I, okay, I nudge you. Okay, now, just to help us understand the strength of this word. Because one is the word Two, it makes no sense if I just urge you and then he invokes the name of God. Paul seldom invokes the name of God, but when he does, this is a very serious thing. Not to be taken lightly. Okay? Now, turn to the book of Acts 16 and then verse 18. Acts 16. And you will see the same word. Okay, but it's not come out as I urge you. It is actually uh, quite different. Acts, Acts 16, right? Now, this is the word. Okay, Acts 16 and verse 18. Now, this was, there was this girl who was possessed with an uh, evil spirit. And she was able to be like fortune teller, divination. Right? Now, look what happens. In verse 16, and uh, who bought her masters much fortune, profit by fortune telling. Can tell the future. Right? That there are fortune tellers around all over the place. Okay? But this one, we read, this girl decided to follow Paul. And then cried out, saying, These men 
are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, what's wrong with that statement? Actually, nothing. It's not about the statement, it's about who said it. You do not want to be associated with fortune tellers. Obviously. Right? So, Paul was greatly annoyed. She did this for many days. That's, you know, he's very patient. Verse 18, Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And of course, lost the ability to do uh, divination. You see the word, I command you in the name of Jesus. Get out. This is true exorcism. Not the stuff you watch on TV where they throw holy water and the cross and all the other things. That word, that name invoked the Lord Jesus Christ carries authority and power. I command you. Okay? This is the word, by the way. Okay, so you must look at what Paul is saying to Timothy. This is uh, absolutely important. Okay? Now, there's another text. 1 Corinthians 7.10 <coughs> where Paul uses the same word here. 1 Corinthians 7. <coughs> and then verse 10, he says, Now to the married I command. Right? Yet not I, but the Lord. Now, there's interesting. In other words, this is like a command from the Lord, not Him. The power and authority behind these words is not Paul's. It is from the Lord. This must be understood. And so he says, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, right? And then let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and to a husband is not to divorce his wife. This is a reference to the issue of divorce and marriage. It's a clear-cut commandment from the Lord. Right? This is not my opinion. This is not my, uh, what I think it is. This is, as it were, a commandment from God. Okay? So just, under, just to understand this word urge, same word. Okay? So one, in the name of the Lord, wow, the evil spirit can... Two, yet not I, but the Lord. Okay? So when we come to 1 Timothy, so we must read this with a great sense of, okay, now this is a, a really serious thing. Okay? In the sight of God who gives life to all. Now that would tell you something. Okay? Even as he, he said these words, he's conscious of the presence of God that is there. The command to be kept before the sight of God. Now, what is Timothy? Now, what is this? Why is this so vital? Right? It all has to do with this man of God. You cannot live a double life. God knows. Obviously, before the sight of God. Right? This who gives life to all things. How come they were just so tired? God is not imbuing them, giving them that life strength. Why? You're not even walking in his ways. 
right? Then it becomes a real problem to a lot of people. Okay, so Paul is saying this is why it is so vital that we, do, we understand this. Absolutely vital, right? And then he says, and before Jesus Christ, of course. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He is that example. <coughs> okay? The good confession. And he says to, to um, Timothy, right? Uh, right? Lay hold of this. You were called. Confess the good confession before the presence. You see, the Lord Jesus saying, look at how the Lord what did he come to do? He came and bore witness to the truth of God. And so Pilate said, what is truth? The famous words, what is truth? Right? Now you can ask questions like that, but that's what Jesus did all the way to the end. He bore witness. The word witness is where we get the word martyr is actually where we get the word martyr. What does it mean to be a witness? You are not afraid to die for your faith. You're not afraid to suffer. You're not afraid to die. And the Lord Jesus Christ was not afraid of Pilate's whatever. He suffered and he died. This is why Paul mentioned this, the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Now, all us who are followers of Christ, that you keep this commandment without spot, without, as it were, corruption, purity, blameless. This is what we need very, very much. So, the man of God must be blameless. If we are going to think about serving the Lord, if we are going to think about that the Lord may use us, this is what is going to be required. Right? We got to keep His word. And this is a real challenge. The word keep, right, over here, is so important, okay, that you keep this commandment. We have to keep His word. Okay, right, any questions you want to raise up over here? Okay. This is a, 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 a very, very strong charge. It must be understood. It cannot be taken lightly. So where Paul invokes the name of the Lord like this, you cannot take it lightly. Obviously. Okay, so the, here is the person. What is his life like? We look at it. One, do we have all the righteousness, godliness, this is all the things. Character, you've got to cultivate this character. Right? You've got to be a person who will keep the Word of God. You've got to be blameless in how you are going to live your life. No other way. This is what we, why we do things the way we do in all the things. It's, see, it, it flows from the person. <coughs> if the person is got bad character, it affects everything. It affects the way you work. It affects the way you do things. It just goes off completely. Right? It's inside you. You just 
you cannot do those things. You just won't. But if it's not, you've not developed it, you've not nurtured it, you've not cultivated it, it seems like a very, very hard thing to do. Okay, I was just reading this text in the book of Proverbs today. It's a real sobering uh, thing to read. It describes people. Okay, three kinds of people and how they learn. Okay, that, let's just take, take a look at the book of Proverbs a little bit. And uh, each day I, I look for gems like this. Each day, one verse, each day. Okay, now, this morning I read this. It was such a, a wonderful, a sobering at the same time text. Okay, in Proverbs 21, and then verse 11. Take a look at the text. Okay. Look at Proverbs 21, and then verse 11. There are three kinds of people here and how they learn. One is called the scoffer. What is a scoffer? A person who mocks, a person who ridicules, basically a person who is both arrogant and stubborn, proud. They just, you know, they, they, have, they don't regard things. They just shoot their mouth. They scoff. See? Both arrogant and proud. Pride is possibly the worst kind of combination. What will stop them? Punishment. You won't learn until you are afflicted by punishment. The scoffer. Right? Okay, there's probably got many things about the, uh, the scoffer. These are all gleaned from reading all the other passages. You note the scoffer is one who is just arrogant and stubborn at the same time. You cannot even reason with them. You can tell, tell them hey, to stop doing that. They are, what? They're just rude, they're crude, they are just going to shoot their mouth. There is a second group of people, uh, people here. They call the simple. Simple Simon. Well, the simple. The simple in Proverbs describes a person that lacks knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Their approach is they react to the situation around them. That's how they learn. They are more reactive. They will see the sco- they see the scoffer get punished, and for a moment they behave wisely. For a moment, they go, "Okay, yeah, yeah, better stop, better stop." You will just see somebody get punished like that. They are very reactive. There are a lot of people that are more reactive than anything else. Right? It's called the simple. There is a third group called the wise. Now, let's read about the wise. The wise is instructed. He receives knowledge. It is not reactive. When the wise is instructed, they will humbly listen. They will learn and they will receive. You see the different groups of people out there in the world? It's sad, but true, how we can fall into different categories, and the Bible almost describes us. Right? There are people who just react. How do they? Well, you're wise. You see, the, the simple is... Right? The, when the scoffer is punished, the simple is made wise. How? Only when you see, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's better 
behave, behave, but it's only for a moment. It's only for the moment. Do they go wiser? No. They still are simple. They're just reactive to life, whatever is happening around them. Only problem come, they watch problem. Well, maybe God is punishing. Okay, better stop. And after that, after the fear is gone, they go back to the same simple again. This is also is a dangerous place to be. This is dangerous, obviously. This is also dangerous. The first two, no good. This is Proverbs' way of saying, look at this. Are you a person who is wise? Because when we read, the wise is instructed. All you need is to tell them once. They take heed. They will receive it. See, in many ways, this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. And sometimes a very strong word is needed. But of course, Timothy has to be. You are a servant of the Lord. You are, you are the man of God. You need to be even more so. But it's essentially there. Does that make sense to you? So what do you see? Go back to the question. What are we pursuing? And very often what we pursue actually tells us who we are. Who we are. Right? It tells us whether this person is truly a man of God or not. All right, any questions you want to raise up over here? It's up time for, uh, to, for you to interact and, and ask questions. <coughs> okay. Now, this is important. See, do, do we really keep the, word, the commandments of the Lord? The word is keep. The wise man will receive it, will keep. The simple, that's too hard, you know, they, they'll make all kinds of excuses. The scoffer just doesn't even bother. Right? The, the scoffer just thinks he's right all the time. Everybody's wrong, they are right. That's the scoffer. It's possibly the worst of it all. This person cannot be even spoken to. This person, you cannot get a word in. It's just, they just want to hear themselves speak. That is a scoffer. They love the sound of their own voice. Scoffers. Amazing, isn't it? The simple may not say very much, but neither are they the wiser. Look at this person, the wise. You know, we've got to be wise. You look at the things, the problems that are there all the time. Life is just so... We can make decisions and it affects not only affects our life, it affects the lives of others. If only we could see that. Our life would always affect others, whether it is positive or negative. It is no, it won't affect anybody. It will, because we are connected. If you are a friend, you are going to affect your friend. If you are a family member, you're going to affect your family members. There's no question about it. So Paul says to Timothy, man of God, pursue, flee these things, pursue these things. And I command you, I urge you, before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, in His sight, 
keep this command without blame. Till when the Lord returns. That means you've got to not just do it once in a while. You've got to prepare to be faithful, steadfast to the end. It's not a spur of the moment kind of faith. All right, I, I, I just do this. And then you goof off again. Till the Lord returns. And we've got to take an active approach towards our faith. The word pursue is active. Right? Very, very much so. Okay? Right? Any questions you want to raise up? Yeah, Lamont. You were referencing the uh, Salvation Army man. Yeah. 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 Better. Yeah. How's he going to take care of all of the different entities yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, you you just can't keep going. What, what should you do? Knowledge. Well, that's what I said to him. I gave him very practical advice. You've got to be one equipped. I didn't I didn't spend f- 3 5 years of being trained equipped for nothing. You've got to be equipped. Or don't attempt this. Yes, equip in His Word, in life. It, you know, the Word of God's got to be part of you. Your whole character has to change. It's, it's you first. You've got to build up your life, in other words, Lebon. It's your character. See, a lot of the time we think, okay, if I've got this skill, if I can speak, don't, you've got to order your life. You cannot live a double life. You cannot live a life of sin. You've got to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and all that is written there. You've got to cultivate this. So when Jesus taught His disciples, Matthew 5, the first thing He said to them, bless are the poor in spirit. You've got to cultivate your spirit. Peter was not poor in spirit. He was full of himself. Neither was the rest. James and John had a temper. That's why they were called sons of thunder. That's the first thing Jesus said. Bless are the meek. Bless are the pure in heart. Blessed are the merciful. Actually, it's all here. So if you, if you desire that God will bless you and your ministry, well, you better start here, in other words. That's what I'm trying to say to him, Lamar. Right now, he's doing this, that, and he is. God is not there, obviously. Yes, you, you, you're doing it your own way. In your mind, if I organize this, people will hear me, people will respond to me, and things will go well. In your mind, it works. It doesn't work. If God, the one who gives life to all things, is not blessing it, it's not going to come to anything. If the Lord Jesus Christ, His example, you don't follow it, it's coming to nothing. That's what Paul was saying here. This is what I was trying to point him to. Because he's trying to share with me his programs, what he's doing, and what's wrong. I said, said, can I tell you what's wrong? It's not just this. It's this. It's you. That's what's wrong. Your knowledge of God is... You lack knowledge of God so badly, as in so badly. Your character, your life, so many things. And so my encouragement to you, one you, one you come, one you learn the Scriptures, I'll be happy to help you if you want to. Well, he say, thank you, thank you, thank you, but it never came.
That's the problem. What can be done? Lots of things can be done. So even when we're here, right, we come for Bible study. We make it, we have scheduled in. Wonderful that you are here. But what comes out of it? See, let's go back to, since we're reading Timothy, let's go back to what Timothy, right from the very start, <coughs> right, 1 Timothy, what is the purpose of the commandments, of keeping it? And Paul says, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the purpose of the commandment is, he sums it in, is love. Wow. Love. Does the Word of God kept in your life produce the fruit of love inside you? Now, what kind of love are we talking about here? Love from a pure heart. Love that comes from a good conscience. Love that comes from a sincere faith. This word sincere faith is not about being sincere. This word sincere faith just simply means genuine faith. True faith. If you have true faith, if you have a good conscience, see, that's what the goal is, that's what the purpose of God's word is. It will create in you a good conscience. It will create genuine faith. Right? It will create a purity of heart. And you will see this expressed in love. God's kind of love will be formed inside you. That is the purpose of the commandments. That's why I said you've got to, you've got to keep, you've got to have this. If not, you're not going anywhere. Why do you do what you do and keep doing it for many years if you do not have this kind of love? You're just going to throw the towel in. You've got to give up. There is so much work and energy and strength and everything to be pulled in. You give everything you ask for nothing in return. If not for love, why would you do this? That's ministry. What do we ask for in return? Have we ever asked for anything? Nothing. We do it. All right? That's what it is. If not for this, you wouldn't sustain it. I mean, you look at the, 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 the amount of energy, the amount of time and human resources poured into the kids' junior choir concert. Just that alone. Just for you to enjoy half an hour, 40 minutes. You have no idea the amount that was poured in from the young people, the teachers. No, they're young adults now, really. If not for love, you wouldn't do it. You certainly wouldn't do it with joy. This is the result of his word inside the lives of people who believe in it, receive it, and practice it. See, that's why, that's why it says, Timothy, you are to command people. You are to teach people. This is the purpose of his commandment. Now, you got to make sure you keep it. Obviously, without, you've got to be blameless because you are a leader. 
blameworthy. You cannot. You can't. You have to do this. Right? This is called responsibility. This is called accountability. This is what I take upon. I have no choice. This is a command. Do it. Right? I have to do this. Do I have to keep this? Do I have to read? Do I have to give myself to study the Word of God like this? Yes! It is a command. Do you understand command? Yes, I do. Fulfill it. It is a charge. Obviously. Right? It's very straightforward in that sense. That's the purpose of the command. Okay? That you don't want how long did it take Israel to learn this? A very painful long time. It's so straightforward. And yet in reality, it is not practice. Okay, it was just reading Nehemiah 9 this morning. And turn to Nehemiah 9. Look at this prayer. This was a prayer made by the servants of the Lord then. And it is one of the most challenging, moving prayer. This is right after the 70 years of being captive. Right? They were Nehemiah's time. Cyrus the king released them. They were to rebuild everything. And they came back. And the thing, that what they did was they read the word of God. Look at chapter 9 of Nehemiah. And we read in the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel assemble fasting with sackcloth, with dust in their heads. Right? Those of the Israelite lineage separated themselves. They confessed their sins, iniquities of their fathers. And then they stood up in their place, read from the book of the law. Listen to this. They stood there and read. How long did they read for? One-fourth of the day. Now talk about long service. Another fourth, they confess and worship the Lord their God. Now, a whole list of names here, servants of God. And they cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And this is what they said. In verse 5, Stand up, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be the, your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made heaven, the heaven heavens, <clears throat> and all their hosts the earth and everything in it, <clears throat> right? The sea and all that is in them, you preserve them all. The hosts of heaven worship you. See, this, just the consciousness of the presence of God. Look at their knowledge of God as they pray. And you, Lord God, you chose Abram. You chose Abram. And you brought him out of Ur of the Chaldean. You gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and you made a covenant with him and give to the land of the Canaanites. Like, see, again, man of God, right? Not this here. Now, you're going to see this whole prayer. When one person God looks at, see, he found Abraham faithful, gives covenant. Through him, bless. That's how it, how it works. Why it is so important to be that man of God? Wherever you are, right? And this one is Abraham, okay? And then we read, to give it to his descendant, you perform your words. You are righteous. Verse 9, Nehemiah 9.9, 9. you saw the affliction of your fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry by the Red Sea. Now, this is Moses. 
You show signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. You made a name for yourself as it is in this day. You divided. See, you did this, Lord. This is like uh, David's Psalm, Psalm 68. They went through the midst of the sea, dry land. Their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day, by a cloudy pillar, by night pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they travel. The Lord's provision. Right? You came down in Mount Sinai, spoke with them. So God spoke with this, His people from heaven, gave them just ordinance, true laws, good statutes, commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath, commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. There's the man of God. There's Abraham. This is Moses. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water out of of the rock thus, and told them to go into the promised land, pro, uh, to possess the land which you sworn to give them. But they, our fathers, acted proudly, hardened their necks, did not heed your commandment, they refused to obey. Look at this problem here. They were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. They hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Even when they molded a car for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt, they work great provocations. Yet in your manifold blessing, mercy, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. Moses prayed for them. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them to lead them on the road, nor pillar of fire by night to show them the way they should go. Verse 20, you gave their, your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold manna from their mouth. You gave them water. God provided again and again. He instructed, He taught, He gave His word. Look, look at these things here. Forty years you sustained them. They lacked nothing. Right? Moreover, you gave them kingdoms, nations, and so and so forth. You multiplied their children Really, the Lord blessed them again and again and again. Look at verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, killed your prophets who testified against them. To turn them to yourself, they worked great provocation. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried out to you, you heard. According to your mercy, you delivered them. This is the book of Judges. Right? And after they had rest, after they are relieved for a while, they did evil again. Therefore, you left them in the hand of the enemies to have dominion over them. And when they return, they cry out to you, you heard. Right? You testify against them that you might bring them back to the law, yet they acted proudly. They did not heed your commandments. You see what, what Paul is saying to Timothy? Keep the commandments. Look at the problems we see in life when they do not keep the commandments. Again, God sends servants to teach, to hear, and then after a while, ah, they don't keep. They shrug their shoulders. They won't hear. They, see, look at this. Verse 29. Okay? They sin again, which if a man does, he shall live by them. They shrug their shoulders. No. This is called being indifference. Oh yeah, whatever. They don't bother. They would not hear. 
Many years you had patience with them. How long would God have patience with these rebellious people? And this prayer, you are gracious, you are merciful, you are gracious. And this was a prayer sent to God. Lord, forgive us. We have sinned against you. Our fathers have sinned against you like this. And ends with, we are your servants. Right? You are just, whatever you have done, you have done faithfully, we have done wickedly. Verse 33. Neither our kings, prince, priests, and all those, they have not kept your commandment, if we are honest. And they have not served you. In the many good things you've given, you've given so many. Verse 36, here we are servants today in the land you've given to us. And they determine, Lord, we will be your servants. We will keep your... See, we, every generation, you've got to determine. You've got to determine. You want to learn from history. You want to learn from the scriptures, from the days of Abraham to, to present day. Same problem today. Yeah, people come, they listen, oh yeah, yeah, commandments, yeah, they, they take it lightly. God has been so patient. Mercifully, He spares. And when he, the prayers are heard, then you go back to the same old way again. Delivered to the enemies, oppressed again, cry out to God. It's like a vicious cycle. Guess what? It goes all the way to the days of the church. Same problem. Who, who keeps the word of God? Diligently. Really diligently. Who knows the word of God and keep it? Man of God, you must do it. you got to do it. And this becomes a solemn charge to all who are going to serve the Lord. Obviously. Obviously. This is why we were so strict on all our teachers. If you want to be a teacher here in Bethel, you better be equipped. Your life will be accounted for. How are you living your life? Before God, you got to be blameless. And you can tell whether the person is of the Lord. God Himself will give life to the person. You will see a great sense of life that just comes. Obviously, you would see the Word of God producing a good conscience. You would see purity of heart. You would see a genuine faith that just keeps on growing. And this is expressed in God's love formed in this person's life. It's obvious. You want to know what we are looking for? We're looking for this. This is how we look for people all the time. Not, not just set up programs. People. We've got to have the right kind of people. If we don't have the right kind of people, you have all the programs also useless. This is why we must look at it very, very carefully and say, Lord, this is what I need to do. How am I living my life? Be that person. Okay? Nehemiah's prayer, the, the prayer is not by Nehemiah, it's by a whole group of them. And we must be the whole group of servants that pray like this. Lord, we are your servants. We will learn from history. You have been very faithful. We have not. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. We've got to do it right. Right? So all the things, we've got to do it right. Every single thing that we look into, do it right. Be blameless. Not anyhow will do. Right? Okay? Well, this is something we got to do. So, 1 Timothy, this is a few verses, but a lot there. 
It's a lot there. Okay, so next week, another verse. Another verse. But in those few verses, it's a vital word to be kept. Person, man of God. We would be that man, be that woman of God. Okay, well, let's pray for a while. Our Father, we pray that your word will speak deeply to our heart. That we would keep, that we will guard, we would treasure, we would receive your word with faith. And it would cleanse us. That it would correct our ways and change us. Lord, give to us a good conscience. <coughs> a sincere faith. A purity of heart that the fruit of faith can be formed well. And we pray that this word would enable us to be greatly challenged, to flee the things that take away life from us, and to pursue the very things that would strengthen us spiritually. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer. And bless in Jesus' name.